from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. Again, we always think of it as this isolated enclave that no one interacted with. It was raised to make way for the first Bush Stadium in 65. I appreciate now the art of storytelling. You know, they used the word eradicated down there. That's what is kind of passed on. It's very important that not only are you welcoming, but that there may be some mentoring going on. I'm Elaine Chaw. Shorthand saves time. It makes writing quicker, which saves minutes and energy. So in theory, that should mean greater capacity for better, deeper thinking. Yet we human creatures adapt, and linguistic shortcuts or easy labels can become so convenient or commonplace that we don't really think beyond them. This has been true in a very specific way with the history of Chinese Americans in St. Louis. To remedy that and share more stories, there's a new formal effort underway, the Chinese American Collecting Initiative at the Missouri Historical Society. Joining me in studio to talk about it are Peter Tao, an architect and community leader who serves as chair of the Missouri Historical Society's Chinese American Collection Initiative. Peter, welcome. Thank you. And Janet Leong, a St. Louis native, whose family restaurant, Asia Cafe, was the last business standing in St. Louis's Chinatown district. She now lives in Chicago and works as a professional career coach. Janet, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So to get to that shorthand, Peter, you are contributing posts to the Missouri Historical Society's blog. And in your first post there, you wrote about the way media has circumscribed Chinese American history in St. Louis to a headline or label, Hop Alley. For those who may not be familiar with Hop Alley, can you provide a brief explanation of what and where it was? Um, Yes, Hop Alley is what is referred to as the Chinatown area, although it is specifically an alley. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, It is actually down where the General American Life building, which is now the Spire headquarters is. So Mm. that's Market, 7th, 8th, and Walnut. And when did that exist, and when did it go away? Um, It lasted from, I mean, it was just an urban area where a lot of uh, immigrants sought their place. So it was around to the 1964. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was the last bit of building before the uh, taken down for urban renewal Mm -hmm. and And the stadium project. Urban renewal has come up uh, a couple times on our show the last uh, last few weeks in particular. (laughs) Peter, how was it that the media fell short with that shorthand for Chinese or Chinese Americans in St. Louis? Well, back then and even now, it, it just seems like it's always just a bunch of non-educated immigrants, a little bit mysterious to people, and they use a heck of a lot of derogatory (laughs) terminology. Mm -hmm. But it was just like, that's all they were. It was just kind of poor, um, even though there were uh, bright spots Mm -hmm. um, that you'll hear later on today. But generally, the media was Mm -hmm. kind of representing that way, and that goes back into the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And that's it's visible in the, the archives that you've looked at, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, Janet, you have very deep St. Louis roots that includes one significant staple of that downtown area and its community. What was that connection, or what is that connection to Hop Alley? And was that moniker uh, used by Chinese Americans, like your family elders, um, did they use that term to describe that area themselves? When I was growing up, Elaine, they didn't really refer to that area as Hot Valley. Um, and, you know, I was born in 1956, so I grew up uh, in the St. Louis suburbs. 
So I learned about the Chinese community, you know, through my father, who is Wing Leong, and his sister, who is Annie Leong. And my connection to Chinatown is really the family restaurant known as Asia Cafe. And there was time that I would spend there helping my aunt uh, with customers, pouring water, folding napkins, and really just observing all the life uh, that was there and all the people who would come in and out of the restaurant. So, so that's my connection. Right. So then you were able to experience it when you were a very young child then. Yes. Uh, my grandmother, my aunt, uh, they ran the restaurant. And so we would go there on weekends and have dinner. And I was able to, quote unquote, help my aunt, you know, with customers and observe her. And my aunt, Annie, was really the informal spokesperson for the Chinatown of St. Louis. And that's Mm. the other way I got to know St. Louis is that uh, she was bilingual. She was very charismatic. She was really the front office of the restaurant where she would wait on tables and greet customers. And so I was able to really observe her and help her and really uh, get to know the restaurant in that way. Mm -hmm. And from your perspective, Janet, How is what happened to that area, which was, as Peter, you've just mentioned, it was raised to make way for the first Bush Stadium in 65. How is Hop Alley and the persistence of that term or name as a synonym for Chinese American presence in St. Louis related to the goals of this Missouri Historical Society initiative? Well, as Peter mentioned, Oftentimes, the terms that were used in the descriptions, either you know verbally or in written form, were not always the most flattering. So it comes across, you know, is a derogatory term. And when we talk about you know urban renewal or the you know raising of that particular area, I think of it as really the out migration of that first generation, like my father, who then went on to college uh, where he attended Washington University so that he could then leave Chinatown, leave the restaurant and become a professional and you know, live a different type of life. Mm-hmm. And to what degree, Peter, uh, do you think that the kind of narrative Janet is describing has been maybe incorporated into the way people talk about the first Chinatown over the, you know, the last maybe decade or so? Yeah, I mean, what's been interesting, and it's very current, I've I've been approached by even some students, and, you know, they use the word, the Chinese were eradicated (laughs) down there. Um, What was happening was very much a sign of just the, the nature of urban environments around the country. It was not a highly thriving area at that at the later stage. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think when you talk about how people use that reference, Hop Alley, it just because Hop Alley was often in those articles, pretty much they were trying to represent it as a bad story. Mm-hmm. You know, crime, drugs, low lives undocumented, because remember, this is a society where you had to be undocumented right. because you were not admitted. The exclusion laws. <laughs> the exclusion and, right. laws. So that's those are all the things that I, I think often get associated with the Hop Alley. And mm-hmm. then bring it forward to today, if this is how we're remembering it, and we use that alley as representation, it, sim- it just seems like it eliminates all the all the other people and community and businesses and that were there that were that were very much a part of people's lives. Mm-hmm. And so this initiative, the Chinese American Collection uh, Collective, collecting, collecting. <laughs> oh my goodness, Chinese American Collecting Initiative. How did this get its start, and when did you become involved here, Peter? Uh, and Janet, how did you become involved from afar? Yeah, it's a really interesting story and how connections work, particularly in the Chinese community. So uh, Peter, through his research, 
uh, unearthed information that led him to connect with me and we started talking about his you know initiative and I learned about what he was trying to do but we also have a connection through the Washington University community because both his father and my father attended Washington University at a time when there were very few minorities or Chinese who were attending university at the time. Mm -hmm. So my father graduated with an engineering degree from Washington University in 1947. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's interesting is um, it actually all kind of came about in 2017. I was actually doing a, uh, a bio for my parents, my father, who was going to be honored in 2017, and at that time he was, I don't know, 999 wow. <laughs> by the OC Organization of Chinese Americans. Mm -hmm. So as I started researching and writing, I was also talking to some elders here in St. Louis who were younger than him but also had certain memories. And then they started putting things down to paper. So as I was writing, I was realizing between my old man and this other old elder in, who's still alive here in St. Louis, that I was learning things that it seemed like no one was knowing. And then I was realizing also because of their age that it was going to be lost. Mm -hmm. So I, in 2017, I actually, uh, Frances Levine is a friend, and I had approached her and I said, you know, we need to document something about this. And uh, they agreed right away. And uh, so in principle, it was agreed to, but it didn't start really till 2021. Well, we're going to take a quick break. This is a good spot here, but we're going to be back very shortly to continue this conversation about local Chinese American history with St. Louis natives Peter Tao and Janet Leong. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Now back to our conversation with Janet Leong and Peter Tao, both native Chinese American St. Louisans and the newly launched Chinese American Collecting Initiative at the Missouri Historical Society. Before the break, Peter, you were talking about um, histories that we don't know, stories that we are not familiar with, and these may be missing from certain records but that doesn't mean they don't exist. So you are, again, you're writing a blog um, for Missouri Historical Society. And the second piece in the series that you are doing is, it a, is about a boy named Hop Leong, who later changed his name to Henry Lang. And he immigrated to St. Louis at nine years old in 1923. Peter, how did you come to Hop or Henry's story? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's where this digging into records is really fascinating. So, I found an article that showed a picture of a bunch of Chinese kids who were all living in Chinatown, and apparently this was a special Chinese class that was created by um, a more national organization to give some cultural lessons to the kids who were already lo losing their roots mm -hmm. with China. So that was interesting already. Um, then, um, then in the article, it mentions the Madison School. Mm -hmm. So the Madison School was where they apparently went to um, for the regular school, which is actually still there just south of uh, the downtown area. Then with that discovery, the Historical Society said, well, we have, that was a St. Louis public school. We have photos. So they f dug into their records. They found photos. And what was fascinating was not to what we were perceiving at what a school environment might have been like, but there was this photo of this Chinese boy on an otherwise all-white um, baseball team. Mm -hmm. 
And it just made us realize, oh, well, he was somehow included, he was somehow integrated, and of all things, he was playing America's pastime sport. Right, right. Um, and then eventually other p- things were found, and we pieced it together, and, a, and an actual news article was discovered about the school and about Hop. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's how the story all came together. Now, what other kinds of stories uh, do you already know you want to include in future blog posts? Yeah, we have a lot of individuals um, that we have found. And, uh, you know, so it's nice. is It is documented in so many different news uh, articles. Um, but you have to use a lot of them to kind of to piece together what you think was their story or life. But in um, some instances, what's really amazing is there um, – so we have found uh, – You know, for example, there's public servants. Um, There are uh, the only, I mean, one of the topics might be the only woman in in St. Louis, Chinese woman. And, Mm -hmm. you know, just the the notion that you're the only one in the entire St. Louis area. And again, that's because of the exclusion that women weren't here. Um, So it's these people who were very much part of their community. Some of them were interpreters. Some of them uh, uh, were the liaison, like working for the uh, On Leong Society and being kind of the bridge. Um, Those are really interesting stories that were happening back then, and they were interacting with everyone. Mm -hmm. But we don't know about that because, again, we always think of it as this isolated – enclave that no one interacted with. Right, right. Now, Janet, you were talking earlier about your aunt and how you know charismatic and outgoing she was, you know, fully bilingual, in charge of the business. Um, are there specific stories that you have heard over time that you would like to see included in that blog or perhaps themes that you feel should be explored? Yes, I think that... Um to really elevate these personal stories makes the history come alive. So I would like to see more stories about the women. And we know that there were not very many women relative to the men because of the Exclusion Act. And so as a woman myself, and oftentimes the minority in a room uh, or in an industry gathering, it would be really fascinating and inspiring to hear how these women were able to establish themselves, run businesses, negotiate um, you know, with others, particularly if English was not their first language. And so I think those stories uh, would be fascinating and inspirational to hear. Mm-hmm. And in your own experience, was it women who largely told you stories about sort of local Chinese American history? Well, in my case, my father was a big storyteller, but so was my aunt. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I appreciate now the art of storytelling and how that really conveys just the feeling and you know what what life was like then. So I come from a long a ve- a line of very strong women. And so while the men may have been the public face, I think sometimes at home, you know, the women would often uh, rule the family. And those stories would be really interesting to hear as well. What is a story, Peter, perhaps that your parents, grandparents or other elders, you were talking about speaking with other elders as you were looking for information to, uh, to pay tribute to your parents. What have they shared with you that you found yourself passing on to others over the years? Well, one that's pretty significant in how, when I say we, I, I include my wife as well, who's also Chinese-American. One of the stories that, um, or what they did that has just resonated for a long time is that they came here, my father came here in 1947 to Washington U. And 
through education. And like Janet said, there were, he counted only 10 Chinese on the campus. And one of which he described Janet's father, but he never mentioned the name until we rediscovered it, which was pretty cool. But he had some people who were local who helped him and helped him and mentored him. So that was something that, of course, is very ongoing with most any immigrant, that a successful life is also one where the community or someone is welcoming. So what was really interesting is as they got their foothold and started their business in the early 50s and they felt confident, um, they then opened up their house to now a slightly increasing student body in the 50s. So our house, our basement, and I remember there because I was the little kid hanging out, um, it was full of just some amazing, bright, shining stars. And because of this mentoring um, and interaction, they have then gone on to be very successful. And um, I think it's that's what is kind of passed on. It's very important that not only are you welcoming, but that there may be some mentoring going on. And with that, then um, improvements in that, uh, you know, continue. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Peter Tao, who is an architect and community leader who serves as chair of the Missouri Historical Society's Chinese American Collecting Initiative, as well as Janet Leong. She is a St. Louis native whose family restaurant, Asia Cafe, was the last business standing in St. Louis's Chinatown district. She is joining us from Chicago, where she now lives and works as a professional uh, professional career coach. Um, Janet, before you got in touch with um, with Peter, were there stories for you two that you felt like um, had been passed along um, that others really need to know? There is, um, so I've been speaking mostly about my father's side of the family, but my mother's family, uh, she came to this country after the communist revolution and her family owned a laundry. And so on my mother's side, we have been documenting the stories and there was part of the family that returned to the village in China where her family grew up. So, so many of these stories I think are very personal and they do get lost because I think we always assume that, you know, our elders are going to be here and they're going to be able to share these stories. So to write them down, and in my case, where my daughter actually recorded my father, her grandfather, telling his stories, mm -hmm. I think is, is so critical. So it's those really small moments and those really meaningful personal things that someone may have forgotten or may not think is important. I think those are the stories that resonate with me the most. And earlier we talked about the, the name of this initiative, and it's not collective, it's not collection, but it is collecting, it's active, right? So as you have been engaging in this very active pursuit of stories, um, of concrete materials as well, um, has diving into that history, has it changed the way you view things today at all, Peter? Um, I mean, yes, I mean, I think it has, um, I think these stories, and I particularly like, um, Janet's father's story, um, but when you hear them and then you bring them forward, you just realize that while some of these stories or situations may have might have existed a century ago or a half century ago or whatever. They are very much applicable now. And in some cases, I might not have had that story told to me in that way. Or in this case, it's in, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a Chinese American story that I can feel more connected to as well. Um, so yes, I I take all these stories or this research that we're doing and I just simply 
fast forward them to now, and that's the purpose of the blog. It's it's almost like we, we want you to read the blog and understand the human first mm-hmm. and the situations and the lessons versus just knowing that it's a Chinese right. story. And is there a specific example of something that has been applicable in the now that comes from the past? Well, you know, I think one thing that's interesting is, uh, and I'll use Janet's father as the example. He's got this wonderful example. Is he's a high school student working in the in the restaurant, and a particular evening, he meets a young Chinese, probably weren't too many back then, Chinese American architecture student from Washington University, mm-hmm. and it's because of that conversation. And probably because Wing saw something in this young man who was pursuing education that it obviously gave Wing the courage to approach, as we discover in the oral history, Mm -hmm. to approach his parents and say, I'd like to go to college. And I think that is what is brought forward is, you know, that when you see something or have some example or inspiration that then it gives you yourself some courage to think about other things that might not have been your norm at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is brought forward. Yeah. Janet, in everything that you have learned, you know, through the work that your daughter has done with oral history and what you have uh, come to glean sort of through the interaction you've had with Peter and with this initiative, Has it caused you to rethink or reconfigure any of what maybe you thought you knew about Chinese American history in St. Louis? It really has made me realize that I have only seen a slice of it through the eyes of a fairly young child who had, you know, memories of one restaurant and interacting, you know, with her family. But is, and I'm deeply grateful to Peter who has just doggedly pursued, you know, these stories and has really opened up my eyes to the fact that there were other Chinese in St. Louis, because growing up in St. Louis at the time that I did, I often felt that there were not very many other Chinese families and that we were alone and that, you know, we were always the only Chinese family or I was always the only Chinese student in my class. So it makes one appreciate that there was a a bigger story and that there was community. And I absolutely agree with Peter. If you see someone that looks like you doing something that you want to do, you're probably more inclined to pursue it because you think if that person can do it, then I can do it too. Mm -hmm. Now, as we're talking about different generations, I'm wondering whether either of you has some sense of whether younger generation folks will approach or interpret it, existing stories and artifacts differently from those who are older. And something I'm, I'm very specifically thinking about is the Globe Democrat news article, Peter, that you had mentioned that's part of the second story-focused, um, or the, the first, that is, story-focused blog post that you made. And it very prominently features the word Americanized or Americanization to refer to um, Hop Leong, who then became Henry Lang. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'm sorry, I, I kind of losing the Yeah, question. so I mean, for younger generation folks, uh-huh. are they going to see or look at um, artifacts of history differently, you think, than older generation folks might? Um, well, I think already this current generation is so much more <laughs> into just stories that um, I think it's something that, yes, I think it'll benefit them. Uh, how, whether or not they'll interpret it, lot, you know, a lot of the older generation may, in, may not be interpreting interpreting it as much, but just kind of accepting certain things as facts Mm -hmm. and just kind of shrugging their shoulders or whatever. Whereas I think the younger generation could definitely see um, a different application. Mm -hmm. Janet, how about you? 
I think the younger generation um, has grown up in a, a much different time and with so much technology and a different sense of history and how they access it because you can just type in anything you know on your computer and something you know will pop up as a story so I think their their access to history how they interpret it and their access to it is is greater than previous generations where we had to do the old-fashioned you know research at the library but I also think this generation um, questions probably more and doesn't take things at face value um, because they have access to so much information. I think that, you know, they have the ability to now step back and say, you know, what what does that mean for me? Why is that important? And why should I care? Because they're being bombarded by, with so much information now. Right. So Janet Leong is a St. Louis native whose family restaurant, Asia Cafe, was one of the last businesses or was the last business standing in St. Louis' Chinatown district. Thank you for joining us from Chicago, Janet. It has been a pleasure and I really appreciate being included in this conversation. So thank you. And Peter Tao is an architect and community leader serving as chair of the Missouri Historical Society's Chinese Collecting Initiative. Thank you as well. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Alex Hoyer is our executive producer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com.